the world's ready for this? I don't know. Are you ready? Yeah. All right. What's up, everybody? Welcome to this bonus special episode of Beers and Breakdowns. Today, you're lucky because we got myself, Abel, and Sean in the building. And today, we're going over Fast and Furious number one. So this is a, something we talked about. We did Gray Man. If you remember that, during, uh, during that we talked about how Abel and I are huge car enthusiasts and huge Fast and Furious enthusiasts. And we said if you guys want to see us review one of the Fast and Furious movies to comment in there and pick which one. So we did a very loose calculation. It looked like a lot of people voted for number one, so we're going with number one. I fucking love this movie. It's a very loose calculation. Very <laughs> loose. We just went like, whoop, whoop, whoop. Yep, number one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think the fact that we both love the original Fast and Furious might have had a lot to do with it. I'm glad Sean could join us. How you doing Thanks, there, man. Sean? All right, good cool. stuff. So we have a movie review channel, and I understand it's a, it's a military sort of centered channel, but I figured every once in a while we could have a little bit of fun with at least one of these. Yeah. Uh, I think this is a movie that had a huge impact on me personally uh, growing up and really pushed me towards cars and yeah it's just an awesome awesome I mean don't get me wrong it's a shitty movie but <laughs> watch yourself an awesome movie at the same time it's the, yeah this for me too this movie shaped a lot of my early adulthood and a lot of my like vehicular choices since and even now today so I, I love it let's get into this one I'm excited quick preface before we get started we know that this was made for Hollywood. We understand completely that a lot of the things in this movie that we're gonna be picking on were not supposed to be real in the first place, but if we went off of that, then we wouldn't be saying anything about the movie at all. So right. I just wanna get that out there. We know the shit's fake. We know that the movie was meant to be fake and it was never meant to be completely accurate, but uh, you know, what fun is that, so. Love that sound. Oh, it sounds so good, they're like in sync. There's a lot to unpack here. <laughs> just, just in this one scene, there's a, there's a lot to talk about here. Um, number one is if I was going to <laughs> gather some vehicles together for me and my crew to go and take down trucks, mm -hmm. I don't know that I would go with a 93-94 Honda Civic. That wouldn't be your first choice? That wouldn't be <laughs> my first choice. Now, for those of you that don't know, the 93-94 to 94 Honda Civic, before whatever they did to it, okay, uh, stock, I think it did a 0-60 to 60 in 10 seconds. If I'm not mistaken, I want to say the base model had all of like 94 horsepower to the wheels or something like that. It had a top speed of 108 <laughs> miles an hour. They only came, uh, my girlfriend had, at the time had one, and it only came with a driver's side mirror. Didn't even come with a passenger side mirror. Yeah. <laughs> so it was like the most <laughs> economical, like no frills vehicle you could buy at the time. And the thing about that is I know what you guys are going to say. Oh, well, they obviously had a lot of money. They, they fixed them up and they had a lot of power because of it, right? But if you were going to do that anyway, why would you start with the <laughs> slowest vehicle that you could possibly get your hands on? And the vehicles that they chose. They took the money that they had. Yeah. They're like, we have this is our budget to hook up these cars. And somebody's like, we need body kits and a wing. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. And, neon and under, lights. yeah, neon, neon lights. lights. It's like, forget about, you know, they did the exhaust and all that. And like, we need wing, we need body kit, we need neons. I think, I think outfitted cargo vans would have been more powerful and more useful for this exact Much more practical. task. And they probably wouldn't have needed three of them. I think they just would have needed one. <laughs> but if they had those, they couldn't go under the trailers. That's true. Hey, whoa, you're jumping ahead, sir. But anyway, with that said, this scene alone has a ton to do with my absolute quest and love for Honda Civics after I watched this movie. Now, not yep. that I didn't like them before, but I was a lot more into like the 88 to 91 CRXs and, and some of the hatchbacks. But after this, I wanted a Honda Civic coupe so yep. bad. And that sound has a lot to do. So they're like highlighting the turbo sound. Mm -hmm. The the intake noise, which by the way, they don't make. I don't know if you've ever heard a car drive down the street, but you don't hear all those fucking noises coming <laughs> out of it. It was just so cool. So I also would like to speak on the tactics here as well. Oh, okay. Yeah. So we're looking at, I guess they're doing kind of, I, I would 
call it a moving or a rolling vehicle interdiction, oh, yeah. which is basically when you're just stopping a vehicle mm -hmm. and taking control of the vehicle and its occupants. So for this one, they're doing a rolling vehicle interdiction. So they have somebody come up through the, the sunroof with a fucking harpoon gun or some shit, yeah. pull out the, the window, then he goes down, then comes back up, shoots it into the seat, and then transitions from one moving vehicle to another one. Yes. I think it would have been a lot better just to, like, stop in front of them and make them stop. Or do something. Put something in the road to make them stop. We'll do a little spoiler alert. This is, in my opinion, Fast and Furious is a great American tale because it shows that with the right amount of ingenuity and determination, you can become anything you want. So at the beginning, they're low-level street thugs. Yeah. And if you fast forward to the end of the series, where they're at now, they are like the world's premier tier one counterterrorism <laughs> unit ever. <laughs> they go to fucking outer space. They're pulling down airplanes with cars. So you all have to start somewhere. So everybody, look at this. You can do it. If you dream it, you can do it. What's up guys, did you know that the mentor program is now live? That's right, we're live. Go sign up now at thefngacademy.com. Click the mentorship program. We have three tiers. Tier three, if you just wanna support the channel or if you just want the exclusive content, it's $25 a month. Uh, we're doing weekly video drops on there and it's the best way to help support us so we can keep doing what we're doing. Tier two is coaching in group sessions and tier one is one-on-one -on -one coaching with a Green Beret. Those spots are currently full, but if you're interested in the one-on-one -on -one coaching, just sign up for the email list. We'll let you know when the spots are available so you guys can sign up. Thank you so much, and we look forward to helping you guys achieve your goals. Also, this video is sponsored by 18 Alpha Fitness. If you want to be SF, you need to be in shape. Go check out Kevin over at 18 Alpha Fitness. Use code word BUCK, and he'll hook you up. So this movie came out in 2001. Okay. It's now 2022. It is. For 22 years... Every time I'm next to a truck on the interstate, <laughs> I'm like, can I make it? <laughs> can I make it? I don't think you're alone, my friend. Uh, yeah, I know, man. I, I just need like a Miata so I can actually do it or a truck that's on stilts like this guy. Uh, if I find some examples, they're going to come up right now on the screen. But I'm pretty sure not only have people felt the same way when they're sitting next to a semi, but some have tried it. And I don't think it fared well. For not, a, uh, not a preferred technique. Because... Uh, Although they did it twice in this movie, you can't fucking fit a Honda Civic, <laughs> even if it's lowered, underneath a semi. I think I can fit. I think I got it. Uh, I remember the day that it came out, there was like all the car guys were at the movie theater. They had like one of the car clubs was able to sit, like have their cars parked inside the theater. Uh -huh. And when the movie let out, it was fucking pandemonium Absolutely. in the parking lot. Exact <laughs> same experience <laughs> for me. Just going around driving like crazy. I saw this movie, I think, four times in the theaters. It oh. was... Where, where awesome. did you where did you watch it? Like where where were you located when you watched it? In Florida? Tallahassee, Florida. Tallahassee. Okay, so I was in Hesperia, California. Oh. Technically Victorville, California. Now Sean's watching this right now at home, <laughs> and he knows exactly what I'm talking about. When we didn't exactly have uh, a replica of the like the the cars that were in this movie outside that movie theater, <laughs> we had like the janky bootleg <laughs> version of those cars and but the same thing happened as soon as we got out people were just doing burnouts yeah and they were just all speeding out of the parking lot me included i was in like a i was in an old chevy truck but i still <laughs> felt the need for speed so i fucking did it anyway but yeah it was this movie was one of those things after you watched it if you were already i mean already into cars and you had your car outside you were doing some stupid yep. shit when you were leaving that parking lot i was in my 1998 chevy cavalier <laughs> well, that's right. <laughs> With a muffler on it. <laughs> <laughs> a butt can. Euro lit. I still, I wish I could get my car to sound like Oh, I know. I was going to say, turbos don't sound like that. So this this scene right here is like where my love for the Eclipse came from at that time. And so I remember like that was like my dream car was to have mm -hmm. a Mitsubishi Eclipse. Because for one, you could get the GST or the GSX. So either front wheel drive turbo or all wheel drive turbo. 
and then just like all I wanted was that mechanical sound. Mm -hmm. And I actually went and test drove one, and I can confirm that they do not have seven gears. Mm. This guy had went through seven shifts, and that's not true. Yeah, and we're just getting started with this movie with the shifts. This is <laughs> this is just the tip of the the tip of the the shifting penis. <laughs> as you can say in this movie, and we're we're getting a lot more than just the tip later on. We're okay, get so the whole thing. I want to start off my piece by saying, "Rest in peace, Paul Walker." Oh, and uh, rip I'm not the gonna, buster. Not going to talk about him personally, but for some reason in this movie, every time he hits like a top speed or something happens to his car at a top speed, he loses control of the car. Yes. So Brian Spillner <laughs> really needed to figure out how to slow down <laughs> and use the brakes once yeah. he had hit. The limit of the Take car. it easy. Because apparently he was like a snowboarder who didn't know how to like stop. <laughs> Once he hit a certain speed, he was, was just like, well, out of control. might as well just throw it. <laughs> That's how I didn't think about that. Every time, though, yeah. he ends up spinning Because he does it in the race, something. too. At the end of it, like something happens to his car and he just spins out of control blade. I'm like, how, why? It's why a liability. Is why is that happening? Why is he giving Tom that thirsty look? I know. He's not there for you, Mia. He's there for Dom. <laughs> Those cars meant nothing to me when this movie came out. Now it's like, they're the best cars in the movie. Oh, I know. Talk to me, Jesse. Say, working, brother. It's your fuel, man. It's got a nasty hole. Another millisecond, just doing the nice time, and you'll run nine. Okay. There's so much going on oh, in this scene. Oh, Jesus. All right, so first off. <laughs> Why is he eating his tuna with no crust? Like a child. <laughs> I don't know. Eat the fucking crust. But that being said, even to this day, my license plate frame says tuna no crust. <laughs> That's how much I love this movie. Are you serious? Yeah, I got a tuna no you crust. You have a like, vanity plate? Just my frame. It says tuna no crust. Oh, the no frame. Crust. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> but yeah, he eats his crust with no tuna. You know what? Whatever. I'm not going to judge. Everybody's got their preference. But the fact that he's there every day ordering the tuna with no crust, it's like he's trying to be undercover. But he's standing out like a sore, a sore thumb right now. Right. So it's like, how did that go in the br in the mission brief? When he's sitting in the room, they're like, all right, so what's your plan? Well, I'm going to go to the store and order a sandwich every single day until I somehow infiltrate. The same sandwich. <laughs> but don't worry, I won't stand out. It's like, oh, no, you're the no-crust guy. You stand out. And then the cars. So if you obviously looking back on it, same thing. When I was in the theater and I was watching the movie, none of these these cars didn't really mean shit to me. Mm -hmm. But now that you now looking back, obviously hindsight, you see like we've got the the GTR, the Skyline, and then we've got the Silvia. But then we have the Volkswagen and the Maxima. Right. And yeah. So I'm wondering why, like you know, obviously they're knocking over trucks and making a decent amount of money. I'd assume. <laughs> so I don't know why he fixed up an old piece of shit Jetta. And then he fixed up an old piece of shit Nissan Maxima. You know, it's Vince, and I think that Maxima fits his personality with the aggressive graphics on the side. Yeah. But, like you said, the GTR, it's a, if I'm not mistaken, it's R33, I think. And then you got the S14 Silvia, which nowadays are like two very highly sought after cars. But when this came out, the time of the, you know, the, the, at that time, yeah. it was all about like Civics, Integras, like those were the Holy Grail cars, Civics and Integras. And then they just came out with the S2000s. Um, and then, like, so it, I guess maybe because it was more attainable and these cars weren't sold in America. But it was cool to see these in the, like, looking back, like, these are two awesome cars that are in this movie. And then you got the Volkswagen and the Maxima. Yep. And uh, shout out to uh, Craig Lieberman, who is the technical director. He has a YouTube channel. You guys should definitely check that out. But uh, he had a lot to do with the cars that were picked for this movie, and he still owns some of them today, I believe. Yeah, I go to the uh, local uh, Orange County Cars and Coffee here in Southern California, which he frequents, and sometimes he'll bring Paul Walker's old Skyline, the gray one, the actual one. From Too Fast, Too Furious? From Too Fast, Too Furious, nice. yeah, the actual one from that movie. And it's not like any of the, I don't think it's any of the copy cars, it's the car. Nice. So, so from what I understand, too, that Maxima was his car. The Blue Maxima, he owned that car. Oh, he did? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. But they completely changed it for the movie. Like, they didn't like the way he had it, so they changed all the graphics, um, put the body kits and all that stuff on it. I don't think, I don't think so. I think, I think you're talking about the Supra. Pretty sure the Maxima was his, too. Oh, it was his as well? Yeah, okay. I, I've seen his, his channel where he talked about it. Oh, okay, because I know the main focal point of that the was... The Supra was. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. What did Dominic say? You don't want to know. What did Dominic say? He wants you out of here. That was the bad he wants news. Me huh? out of here? Yes. And what you did don't you say to Dom? What do you think I said? 
I told him good help is hard to find. I need Nas. I need Nas. Alright. So I, I just love how he's like washing. He's like, what do I do? I need to be faster. And he looks up. And there's just NOS <laughs> like uh, banners plastered all over the wall. Yeah. He looks up, he's like, boom, light bulb moment. Right. I need NOS. Like in the process of of decking out that car and doing everything <laughs> that's done to that car, NOS never crossed his mind. Nope. Even though the bottles are in a display case in front of the store. All over the place. He lives in this fucking room. Right. <laughs> so they're everywhere. But so that I'm glad you said that, right? So a thing that used to bother me, and like maybe it was just our area, I don't know, but um, everybody that had nitrous, right, we never called it NOS. NOS, N-O-S, uh, oof, people are going to light us up for this one. It's a company I name. I think it means nitrous oxide solutions, but I may be wrong, right? But it's a company name. Right. But we always just called it nitrous. And then so when this movie came out, everybody's like, NOS, NOS, NOS. You could always tell the people that were just yeah. new to the car scene because they always just called it NOS. And we're like, eh, that's not what it's fucking called. Get out of here, you noob. Um, but it was one of those things that just kind of bothered us all the time. But I just love the fact that he's like, I need nitrous. You know what? The big one. Make it two of them. Yeah. It's like, it doesn't, this, having two of them doesn't matter. If you, like, understand how the nitrous works, I mean, you just get to spray it longer. But Yeah, if you, it, also, if you understand how nitrous works, then the fact that your car's topping out at 140 miles an hour. Right. And your NOS is your solution. Hmm. For the 140 mile an hour top speed, right. I'm like, wh so what type of top speed are you looking for? Do you think it's going to get you to 180? It's just going to get you to 140 hour? faster, right? <laughs> so or when this guy's you're like, you're just going to explode on the way there. Like this, like Harry engines. said, he's like, amateurs don't use nitrous oxide, and if from what we've seen so far of Brian Earl Spilner, maybe he doesn't need nitrous oxide. Yeah. What do you think, Sean? Okay, that's an interesting take. <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna stop it here and I'm gonna apologize ahead of time. I'm sure you, I'm sure that was silent, uh, because this scene has demonetization written all over it. Yeah. There's just a ton of songs in here that I know they're going to get me for. I wanted to talk about this part of the movie because car meets are not like this <laughs> at all. They never have been. They never will be. Uh, one thing that stands true is girls don't give a fuck about. For the most part, cars, and I'm not saying that there aren't female mechanics out there and brilliant engineers and girls that work on cars and love cars. I'm talking about all the models that are walking around at this car meet, right. um, the all the cars on hydraulics, the mass amounts of people walking around and there's just a girl on everybody's arm. It's not like that at all. <laughs> uh, car meets are just a bunch of mainly just fat dudes yep. <laughs> yep. standing around. Talking shit about our cars, exactly. and ninety percent of it isn't true. Yeah, uh, yeah. If you've ever been to a car meet, you'll know it's not like this at all. It never has been, and never will be. So it's a very toxic environment, honestly. It is. It's pretty <laughs> bad. It didn't used to be as bad, but lately it's just gotten really, really bad. If you're talking about something like cars and coffee, which is typically, obviously, in the mm -hmm. mornings, given the coffee part, it's really cool. There's a lot of cool people out there. There's really expensive, really nice cars, nice builds, uh, and the crowd is different. But if you're talking about night meets, which I frequent every once in a while. I'm um, still super into car stuff, so I'll go occasionally, and it's nothing yeah. like this at all. Same plenty of night meets, because a lot of times if you're going to a night meet, your goal is to go there to race people, and so like yeah. I've had like tons where I've seen like fights break out, just people go crazy, yeah. like just a bunch of weird shit happens. Now let me be clear, uh, there's a big difference between a car meet and uh, like a street racing function or something like that that people are trying to do on their own, and a car show. Car yeah. shows are like this 100%. If yep. you go to, like, I used to go to this thing called Hot Import Nights. Mm -hmm. uh, me and my, whenever it came to town, me and my cousins would all get in a load up in one car and go. And it was amazing. I mean, obviously, they had hired models around all the cars. Yep. They had music, they had stereo systems, they had lights, they had concerts. It was insane. And it was probably a lot more like this than anything else is. Yeah. But the car meets themselves, and especially the street racing scene, was nothing like this. Yeah, a lot of guys had their girlfriends there with them, but they weren't dressed like that. Right. Yeah, I used to love Hot Import Nights. I didn't pour nice, and if anybody remembers Nopi Nationals, yep. that was like the largest car show in America, and it happened every year in September in Atlanta, Georgia. I was there for, I think, the last four or five years in a row uh, before they shut it down. And that was a good time. Yeah, those are really cool. But with that said, the way they portrayed this scene was awesome. 
Like, I loved the idea that this would exist, mm -hmm. but unfortunately, that's all it is. I idea. just, I never found it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I went looking for it. And my busted ass CRX with a missing front end, it had a hole in the hood because it shot a piston through it. Like the actual, uh, you know, like the, the front, I'm not, not a piston, a strut. Yeah. So the person that had it before me went out mud bogging this, CR, this poor CRX and it <laughs> shot the strut through the hood. So there was a big hole in the hood. I used to have to blast the AC to keep it on. The car? The car. I used to have to blast the heater so that it wouldn't overheat so that it'd stay on. Oh my god! And then occasionally the end, the, oh the way the CRX was set up, this wasn't one of the nice ones. It wasn't an eighty-eight to ninety-one. I mean, if you call that nice, it was like it was an eighty-six. So it was oh, an ugly one. Oh yeah. But it, I got it for free, so I loved it. And what what happened is the the transmission would fall on the axle because the mount would break, and it happened <laughs> twice. So me and my dad took a big steel bar, and we drilled it into the frame of the CRX. And then we drilled it into the transmission so that it would hold it. Oh my god! So when I drove around, I only had first, I had first, second, and fifth. And that was it. <laughs> That's terrible. Yeah, and instead oh of fixing any of that, I bought a, I bought a kicker 12-inch subwoofer of course. in the back. Yeah, so I could bump and I'm So you're trying? Around. I imagine you're trying to get on the freeway. You're like, meh, meh, meh. yeah. I used to downshift all the way to second in case I had to race somebody. That's funny. So my, my 98 Chevy Cavalier, I tried to put my lowering springs on myself, and I had no idea what the fuck I was doing. And I realized that pretty quickly once I got into the job. So I put it back together, but I didn't do the strut mount right. Mm -hmm. So every time I hit a bump, the strut would come through and hit the hood. Oh, shit. So on my left front, I had a fucking nipple like, coming <laughs> at the top of the hood where it would just hit every time. Oh, uh, uh, humble beginnings. We all start somewhere. Oh, absolutely. this part. Okay, this is a perfect example of exactly what a car meet was like. Without all the models and all the lights and all the music and all that stuff, this is actually what it was like when people were either getting to a street racing car meet or leaving one. It was just, and I used to uh, go to here in Ontario, California, that's where, in, at least in Southern California, the biggest, like, that was like the epicenter for mm -hmm. street racing. And they would all get together after like 11 o'clock midnight. Me and my friends would all go and take all the cars we had. And that's exactly what it was like. It was massive amounts of cars. I mean, at that point, you can't even try to hide from the cops. They would just change the location. But mm -hmm. every time they left, it was just like that. Like, laws didn't apply. The mob mentality just sets in when you have that many cars in, yeah. in one place. They're just going over curbs. They're just going, they're running stop signs, running lights, going everywhere. And all those headlights moving around and all the exhaust and all that stuff. Uh, that's exactly what it was like. That's and it was awesome. It was exciting as fuck every time you were there. I always wanted to experience that. We never had that. We had a smaller town where I was, so we didn't have that. Oh, we had it, we had it like hardcore here in Southern California. It was big for a long time. Like, it took a long time for it to dissipate. And we're talking yeah. hundreds of cars that would get together. And we had a lot of industrial areas there in Ontario and uh, and Ranch Cucamonga, and that's where it was huge. Where and it looked just like that. So if you were looking for an accurate representation in this movie of what it was like to actually be at a street racing like event, uh, that's what it was like. Damn. You no, know, Edwin happens to know a few things, but one mm. of the things Edwin knows is the roof scoop. It's not how you stand by your car; it's how you race your car. So, <laughs> to illustrate how much I love this movie and this car, right? Talked about my 98 Chevy Cavalier. I wasn't able to get the Eclipse because I couldn't afford it at the time. I could afford a Cavalier. Not the same class of car at all, right? Yeah. But I ha ended up, eventually ended up getting a little bit more money and doing stuff to it. I put a wide body kit on this car. A full, like, full body kit. Replace all the bumpers, side skirts, all that. A wide body kit, so widen the fenders. I molded a roof scoop on the top, just like this car had a roof scoop. I had almost the exact same seats, except for he had Sparkos, they were name brand, I couldn't afford that, so I had off-brand, yeah. but they looked the exact same, my racing seats. Like, I, I did as much as I could to make that Cavalier this Eclipse. Like, and you bondoed the... Yeah. You bondoed the roof scoop in? Yeah, and I was so poor at the time mm -hmm. that every little bit of financial aid I got for school went into my car, <laughs> but I could only afford the parts, so I had to do everything myself. So I'm in my driveway sanding the metal down, or sanding the, the roof down to metal. Didn't understand how things work, so unfortunately, I put the roof scoop on, and I did it incorrectly, and it used to hold water, and the entire roof rusted through, and there was holes in it eventually. Oh, shit. <laughs> but I did what I could to make it look like this. And don't talk shit. I love that car. <laughs> Still this thing. Oh, they're talking shit for sure. <laughs> Welcome to YouTube, my friend. <laughs> On that CRX, same thing. I couldn't afford... It was a free car. I couldn't even afford the car itself. 
So whenever I did anything, I had to do it myself too. So I couldn't afford an exhaust for that car. So I just got an exhaust tip. Do you remember 3A Racing from like Pet yes, Boys yes, and, and AutoZone? Yep. So I got this 3A Racing exhaust tip. And then I used to tell people I had an exhaust because I'm a lying sack of shit. <laughs> and then um, the, the sunroof came off completely. Like it flew off of the car. So I couldn't <laughs> drive it anymore because if it rained, I was screwed. So uh, I cut a, me and my dad cut a big piece of plexiglass. And then we just went to Home Depot and got these huge <laughs> screws and screwed them into the fucking the roof of the car, like on the outline oh, of the no. sunroof, so that it would stay. Uh, and then we put sealant, like house sealant, yeah, like with the gun all around it. We smoothed it out so it was waterproof. And for a while, I drove on the inside because we didn't uh, we didn't have a, a cutter that would cut through these screws. Uh, on the inside of it so these screws were so long we didn't oh account for uh, so i would drive <laughs> with these screws sitting right next to my head and if something ever happened my head was going straight into those oh. things and it was gonna be lights out but hey man you gotta do what you gotta, you gotta do. do what you gotta do man and again i was bumping though <laughs> <laughs> i had my my rockford fosgate amp in the back yep, with my kicker yep. 12 and i had my little my pioneer that i saved up for that had some graphics in the yep. front of it Dude, I remember I used to do the the L7 came out, the square kickers. Mm -hmm. Remember yeah, those? Yeah, the square ones. I had L7s for years. I used to love those speakers. But yeah, first thing I did any car was put the speaker in the back. No sun, man. No sir. When I got when I finally got the speakers that I wanted, I got the JL Audio, oh, the Dove Twelves. Nice. Yeah, those, I do and, remember those. And those things were just amazing. Could I tell the difference between another speaker? Absolutely not. I had no clue what I was talking about. But I remember all these people always saying, oh, I got dubs. Like, I got dub 12s. I got dub this. I got dub that. Yeah. And I was like, what is that? And they were like, oh, it's the speaker. So, it's like, JL Audio was all, it was super expensive. It was yeah. all the rage. But I, luckily, I worked at a pawn shop at the time. Oh, so nice. So, I, I ended up getting a deal on stereo equipment all the yeah. time. I couldn't afford the JL, so I went to Kickers. <laughs> That's still a nice car today, the way it is. Oh, I know. That station wagon again. What the hell's going on around here? Streets closed, pizza boy. Find another way home. Goddamn street racer. <laughs> I just thought that was cool. It's because that's the uh, uh, Rob Cohen. He's the director. He's of the, the movie. director of the movie. Yeah. yeah. They did a little cameo. That's pretty that was cool. Yeah, that's pretty cool. We got to bring that stuff up. Okay, um, not even talking about the fact that that damn car doesn't sound like that in real life. No <laughs> car does. That sounds like a car from outer space. You ever seen The Wraith? No. It's a sick movie. Comment down below if you've seen a movie called The Wraith. And it's about this guy. I think it's played by Charlie Sheen. Okay. And it's a kid that dies. And he comes back like somehow from the afterlife in a badass space-like car. And he street races the people that killed him. Because they're like a car, cl like a car crew. <laughs> <laughs> and so what he does is he races them, and he goes like so fast that they lose him, and then he parks sideways. So when they come around at like the turn, yeah, they crash into him and they explode and they die. And because this car is like from another world or whatever, he doesn't. And he just drives off. That sounds awesome. And he does that, <laughs> and he does that until the entire crew is dead, and then he gets his girlfriend back. What the hell? That sounds terrible. Way to go, Charlie. It's an amazing movie. Yeah, it sounds like it. Well, it was awesome when I saw it when I was when I was when I was little. <laughs> it's a cool movie whatever fuck you all right so uh on this part so he he opens up his uh his din uh stereo mm -hmm. right the screen pops out you guys remember that everybody had an oh, escalade for a while and, and fucking mtb cribs you know you can thank mtb cribs for that shit but that stuff's popping out so he's got like some weird like data yeah. or something popping up on his stereo system that's got to do with the performance of his car and then he opens a laptop that has like these I don't know what they are. They're like they look like silos almost. They're, yeah. And Whatever then what kind says of parameters. stage one, stage two, stage three. Um, now, for those of you guys who don't know anything about cars, some of you might say yes, we know. Some of you don't know. That's not how shit works. <laughs> you don't click on your laptop you to yeah. go through the different like maps or state. I don't know. You also don't use your the screen of your stereo as a supercomputer to run the performance of your vehicle. It plays music in MP3s. It's about the, that's about the extent of its capabilities. Back then. <laughs> yeah, I mean, now we do have, uh, you have tunes, you have tuners that have screens on them, things like that, and then you have different maps, uh, most people call mm -hmm. them, and that's just basically, you can change the tune of the car 
uh, to have you know 800 horsepower, 900 horsepower, 1200 horsepower, depending on what you're doing. So that way you can you know have a drivable car. If you have a really powerful car, you can you know put a map in that's less powerful so you can manage the power. Mm -hmm. um, and now that's real, and that can be done with laptops. You, people will have laptops sitting in the car so they can change the tune of their car. But for the most part, it's like a module. Um, but this, especially at the time, <laughs> yeah. No, sir. At the, could you imagine that laptop in 2001? <laughs> I know. It was probably like this fucking thick. I wonder how many people just put laptops in their cars so that people would think that this is what they <laughs> right. were doing. Like, my iPhone is way more powerful than that laptop. Absolutely. By far. Absolutely. Which is crazy, because you can now change the tune of your car with your iPhone. Yeah, you can do it all Bluetooth. Yeah, it's just OBD2. So yeah. you just plug it into that, and then you just... So actually, real quick, one thing, I remember seeing a post by Craig Lieberman, who again was the technical director for this film. Um, he was talking about how they engineered the exhaust sounds, especially for the green car. And he was saying like they took like a plethora of different sounds. Like he said there's like animal like calls and sounds that are actually in there as well, just to get that very unique sound. Uh. And we'll have to find his Instagram post on that. But he, he was saying that like there's just a tons of tons of different sounds they just mixed together. But the thing on this part, for me, right, this is one of the great movie mysteries of all time. Yeah. So he hits the second stage of nitrous, yeah. of NOS. NOS. And then all of a sudden it pans to the floor. And for some reason he's got a, a, a diamond plate floor panel that just happens to be there. And then nobody knows why that's there. Which also happens to be the only thing between him and the ground. Yes. Or like that part of the car and the ground. There's nothing yeah. in between that, which... It, for, it doesn't make sense. Car, you don't do that. There's yeah. no reason to have that. But then when he hits that second stage of nitrous, one by one, all the rivets pop out and the bitch just flies out. Yeah. So it's like, what the fuck just happened? I can't imagine that like at least like 20 people on set weren't like... I, I, I imagine that like Craig is, that is sitting there in these meetings <laughs> and he's like, no, Craig, hand down. Nah, no, Craig, I got it, hand down. <laughs> Craig seems like a semi-serious guy. Yeah. He doesn't really strike me as a guy that's just going to like laugh that one off I just, I just feel like he's sitting there going he lost that battle the fuck <laughs> he's like, are fuck, you doing whatever. yeah that to me though I've that's one thing that's always baffled me it's like one of those great movie mysteries like I said so I just, yeah like I, I don't know if, if um, I don't know if if like they're portraying the g-forces are so strong at that point that it's literally shooting rivets out of a diamond plate maybe like the the chassis is is torque or not twerking <laughs> it's torquing <laughs> <laughs> chassis is twerking. Uh, it's, it's torquing to the extent that it's popping out, which, you know, whatever. But why is there a fucking removable plate right there anyways? Doesn't yeah, make sense. Doesn't make any sense. Whatsoever. Doesn't make sense. And also the portrayal of speed in this movie is cool uh, on, in one sense, but it's also extremely fake in another. So they keep warping everything and you see a speedometer. Apparently the NOS did get him past... 140. Yeah. Uh, he's like doing 160 or something like that. So yeah, he's getting 20 miles per hour. Now, I'm not going to claim to be a mechanic or an engineer or anything like that. So, fuck, I don't know if nitrous can really give you 20 more miles per hour. I fucking doubt it, but maybe. Um, I shouldn't tell this story, and I, I'll decide at the end whether if I'm going to uh, include it. <laughs> but uh, as you guys know, um, I have a 2020 BMW M5 competition. Um, for those of you who don't know anything about this car, the car has a decent amount of power. Uh, it's not the fastest car in the world, but it's not the slowest one. And uh, Sean came out here for a beers and breakdowns trip, and then I took him to Cars and Coffee. On the way to Cars and Coffee, we got into a little bit of a race. In Mexico. In Mexico. Yeah. Uh, I'm <laughs> sorry. Yeah, I, I went to the Mexico Cars and Coffee. Uh, and I took Sean for the first time. Sean hadn't really been to a Cars and Coffee, so we had to go to Mexico for Cars and Coffee. On the way to, on the way to Cars and Coffee, Mexico Cars and Coffee, we encountered uh, a GTR. A Nissan GTR, a newer one. Yep. Uh, it was all decked out. It had uh, a wide body kit. I think it was a Liberty Walk. I'm not sure. And it had a huge wing in the back. And I could tell it was just all decked out. Uh, anyway, we ended up getting into a race. And it was a very high speed race. So we ended up hitting 174, 175 miles an hour Jeez. on this two lane <laughs> highway in Mexico. And neither one of us wanted to let out because we were so neck and neck that 
whoever let off first is technically losing yeah. because we're so close. So we wanted to see who would pull. And so once we get that speed, I was like, okay, I'm out of it. I don't want to go any faster than this. So I let off the gas and we like kind of felt like we were on a cloud for a second because there was some bumps that came up, some whoops. <laughs> and the car was slowing down. It's got good brakes, but I didn't want to overdo it. We were doing about 145 when we went over those whoops and we went down. And I remember Sean kind of looking over at me to see how confident <laughs> I was at that moment uh, and just being feeling like assured as to whether we were going to die or it's not. like, should I freak out? Yeah, by my, <laughs> my facial expression. And uh, I, I kept it together, even though on the inside I was like, that's it. <laughs> it's fucking over like it's over like i felt the bumps and i didn't expect them and i was like yeah i got no control i got no control right now it's over dude Damn. we're gonna be on the fucking news anyway the car slowed down and everything was good but even at that high of a speed um it you still have new cars just do an amazing job mm -hmm. of making you not feel the speed yeah, so they uh, mask the you speed. still have perfect vision nothing is zooming by you so fast that it's like distorted it's it's, yeah, it doesn't look anything like that. So yeah. the other thing with these races is they're all so freaking long. Oh like, yeah, they're they're doing a normal street race is you roughly shoot for about a quarter of a mile, mm -hmm. right? I've seen some longer, whatever. But every race in this movie, they're going like top speed, like through all the gears. It seems like each race is at least a mile and a half long. Yeah, it's it's crazy. It's a lot of space. I don't raise my it's homeowner's it. insurance. Are you out of beer? No, there's one more. That's disgusting. It is. This guy just got a Miller Lite, y'all. Please don't tell that. They can see it. <laughs> it's Sean's. It is. There you go, Sean. <laughs> By the way, real quick, um, if you guys want, drop in the comments down below what your first car was. Yeah. Mine was uh, a 1986 single cab Ford Ranger Ooh. with a blown engine. <laughs> Mine was a 1994 Toyota Camry. Had it for about three months and then got my Cavalier. Dude, almost had you. <laughs> you almost had me. You never had me. You, you never had, had your car. So nice. Granny shifting, not double, double clutching like you should. You see the Shermanator back there? Is that him? Right there, look. Yeah. Oh. It's not him, it just looks okay. like him. Okay, <laughs> I was about to say. Ask any racer. Race. Any real, real racer. Race. It don't matter if you win by an inch or a mile. Winning's winning. Mm. That's life advice. So for me, that is probably the greatest monologue in movie history. I agree. It, it has made the biggest impact on my life. It has, it, it's one that I still remember to this day. I love it. Absolutely love it. Yeah. It's such a pivotal point in my life. This whole movie is like just set the tone for my life. <laughs> I, I cannot, it's one of these movies, like if it comes on, I cannot turn it off. I know, is it sad <laughs> that at this point in our lives, that this was probably one of the most impactful things that ever happened to us and shaped us as human <laughs> beings. Because <laughs> it sounds kind of sad to say. It, it does, but I'm happy with it. I like I, I like it. I this... fucking love this movie, and I want to. I always wanted to make sure I never, you know, blew the welds on my intake. Yep, you never want to blow the no, welds on your intake. Never want to blow the welds. You on never want to put enough NOS in there to blow yourself up either. By the way, we bypassed this a little bit ago, but uh, Jaw Rule was in this obviously before he tried to put on the world's worst music festival in existence. <laughs> but and then he says that it's not how you stand by a car, it's how, how you, you waste your car. car. Taking life that. advice from good old fire <laughs> festival Jaw Rule. <laughs> I love during the race, he's like, no, Monica! <laughs> Alright, this part's always blown my mind. Why? Be because, I mean, there's a, there's a few things. Um, number one, that cop somehow spots him and knows exactly who he is yeah. and just does this insane 360 in the middle of the streets <laughs> instead of just stopping and opening his door and being like, hey. Hey, uh, you. Um, one thing. Number two, I don't know why he, I don't know why Dom cares. This cop can't do anything to him. He didn't pull him over. He, he's not in his car. He's walking just down the going street. Going for a walk. He could easily, he could just say, hey, you were street racing. He's like, doesn't look like I'm street racing right mm. now. <laughs> but for some reason, he takes off running. He does. Which shows guilt. Yes. Which <laughs> like, for, why were you running? You were chasing me. For Dominic Toretto to be the leader of this entire fucking <laughs> brigade, it just seems like questionable decision making. Be smarter. To just take off running from the police, who's in a car, by the way, 
and he's just walking. What always gets me is you see it a little bit when he like pulls into the uh, the parking garage here, mm -hmm. like full speed, and like that's that's one thing he's trying to get away from cops. But frequently these guys just like there's a scene where he goes through his driveway at his home, full speed he's up, like, there. like full sin. Yeah. For those who don't know, this RX-7 that he has, which RX-7 is one of the most desirable tuner cars, especially that model, it's called the FD RX-7, right? Um, rotary engine, awesome, amazing car. Is that the twin turbo model? Yes. Yeah. But what he has on top of this is what's called a Veilside body kit. So Veilside is a Japanese company that makes body kits and other aero parts for cars. Um, and Veilside is not cheap. Like it is like known as one of the most expensive, or used to be one of the most expensive, body kit manufacturers right. there was. So the fact that you would you know wait months and months and months when you bought one of these things for it to get produced and shipped from Japan, you'd pay thousands upon thousands of dollars, and then just have no regard for it whatsoever. It's just kind of like it's not only that. Way. I mean, paying thousands and thousands of dollars just for the body kit is just the beginning. When they show up, they don't show up painted for your car. The mm -hmm. way people would do these. Um, you had one or two things happen when you saw a car with a, a nice body kit. They either bought the body kit and didn't have enough money to paint it and have it molded to the car correctly, and the car was going down the street with a primer body kit. That was me. Um, just how, <laughs> how it showed up because they just were that excited to have it on the car. Or you had somebody who had enough money to buy the body kit and have it fitted now, a lot of people think that you can just buy a body kit and throw it onto a car, and that might be the case now in 2022, I'm not sure, but when back then, when it came in, it still needed to be what we call molded to the car. Mm -hmm. So just because you like put it on doesn't mean it was going to fit. The body lines weren't going to be right. It just wasn't going to show up the way it was supposed to. So they would have to fit it and mold it. In some cases, they would have to use Bondo to make sure that the lines um, were correct against the car, make sure that it ended the right way and that it was the right fitment. And then they would paint it. Now, if you already love the color of your car, you're going to have to have a paint match to it. And if you don't love the color of your car, you're going to have to repaint the whole fucking car. <laughs> And to have a good paint job done like that that car is, that yeah. RX-7, that's like a $15,000 paint job yeah. even to this day. I mean, it's not cheap. That was me. I had my Cavalier was red. My body kit was primer gray for a long time. <laughs> yeah, this is before wraps like, were a thing and right, readily yeah. available. Like now you can just wrap, you know, probably just mold it to the car um, if you're going to do that and then wrap the whole thing. You know my fix? Instead of to make it all match? I just primer grayed the entire car. <laughs> <laughs> so I had no more paint. I drove like that for a long time, just primered my car. Hey, man, you did more than me. Sadly, I never in my life have had enough money. I mean, until now, but back then, I never had enough money to actually buy a body kit. Um, in uh, some cases, I thought about buying at least a front bumper. Oh, no. And I never you got to do it all. And then I never saved up enough money to actually do it. I'll see you in the desert next month. Be ready to have your ass handed to you. Yeah, you're going to need more than a crotch rocket. I got for you. Okay, I wanted to talk about this part because of the uh, the line that Dom specifically says. You're going to need more than that crotch rocket. <laughs> now, I don't know if you guys know how fast crotch rockets are, which are street bikes. Um, I think back then, like, you know, the CBR, um, I think it was a 951. It was a weird CC 954, number. 954, I think. 954, there you go. Um, those were all the rage. The Jixers. Yeah, the Jixers. Uh, everybody love the Jixers. Love the Jixers. Those bikes would smoke everything in this movie that i've seen so far yeah that, without a doubt that crotch rocket is all he would need at race wars to beat fucking everyone yeah um, dominic's rx7 as nice of a car as it is yeah is not going to stand a chance against that no production cars to this day even uh, highly modified cars to this day aren't going to be faster than street bikes now if you're getting into anywhere from i mean it's going to be loose so don't crucify me over this but anywhere from like eight to 1400 horsepower cars high dollar builds like vipers um, Corvettes, you know, all those things you see on 1320 or like the Texas runs, things like that. Mm -hmm. Yes, those are probably going to be faster than a crotch rocket in the top end. But um, overall, just taking off some of these, you know, bikes, it's just, no, it's not possible. No, not going to uh, happen. Unless you're running a Tesla Plaid, you're not beating a fucking right, crotch rocket. Right, yeah. <laughs> not on the table, Carlos. <laughs> oh, fucking Shona McGregor. <laughs> oh, yeah, Shona McGregor's on the fucking Shona McGregor. Fucking Maria, motherfucker. Okay, I get you a Shona McGregor. Uh oh. Yeah, I got you, buddy. Do you see anything wrong here? No. I see a lot wrong. Look at that guy's highlights. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on, Lance? <laughs> yeah. Oddly enough, he's got the same hair as Lance Bass from NSYNC. Oh, SR20 motors a pull up premium one week before Race Wars, huh? Yeah. Probably. You're a smart fence, Ted. Maybe too smart. So one 
This is something that's always bothered me from this movie. They come in, he shoves his head into the empty engine bay mm -hmm. of when they pan out what you see is a Civic and an Integra. And he says, a couple of SR20 engines would pull a premium a week before race wars. So an SR20 engine is a Nissan 240SX in Japan, the, the S14 car that we saw earlier. It comes with an SR20 engine. Not for a Honda, not for an Integra, which is also another form of a Honda. So the fact that he's just like, where's the SR20s? It's not for these cars. It's not realistic. So again, bad technical direction. Mm -hmm. Listen to your advisors, because that doesn't fit. Yeah. Love an SR20, but it's not going in that car. Should have been B16. It should have been, yeah, B16, H22 maybe back then, kind of holy grail. Yeah. B18, I don't know. H22 was a prelude motor, right? Yep. Oh, that prelude, I wanted one of those so damn bad. <laughs> oh, that prelude. That, that might as well have been a Ferrari. Yep. Oh, back in the, the prelude was like, whoa, dude's got prelude. I remember I worked at a, a place called Tires Plus. It was a, a basically they did tires, oil changes, stuff. Mm -hmm. And I remember somebody came in and brought a prelude in, and I got to do four tires in alignment. So I was like, test drive, baby. Uh, Dude, I went on the longest test drive ever. I'm riding around. I remember I saw somebody from high school, and I pulled up, and I looked at him. I was like, yeah, bitch. <laughs> Look at your boy in the prelude. <laughs> and then I drove her back to the shop and gave it to the customer. All these cars <laughs> that we idolize so much that are the slowest pieces of shit on oh, the road. Oh, I know. If you, have a, if you have a prelude, I'm not sorry. Your car's slow as fuck, and that's just the fact of it. That's just how it goes. I'm not, <laughs> but it's it faster it than a single cam Civic. It is. It is. And you can take pride in that. There's nothing wrong with that. But, damn. I was in love with, uh, with the 2000 uh, Civic Si. Specifically the, Bro, the blue one. The Electron Blue Pro. Yeah. Yep. That was another holy grail car for me, was the Civic Si. I wanted one of those so bad. I still want one of those. Yeah. But man, remember that VTEC used to hit? If you oh, had an know, intake yeah. and an exhaust on a car with VTEC, you're like, meh, <laughs> <laughs> It's like, damn! Good old VTEC. <laughs> Gotta oh love VTEC. Old variable, variable valve timing. I don't know who they had sitting up in marketing at Honda, but I hope that guy has got a mansion and a half for, oh, for, for sure. putting that into motion. Because damn, did you sell some cars, And sir. then you just put the little sticker on the side. Mm -hmm. He's like, oh, fuck, that's an SI. I live my life a quarter mile at a time. Nothing else matters. Not the mortgage, not the store, not my team and all their bullshit. For those 10 seconds or less. Like a vampire. Is he CGI'd in that I'm one? free. Mm. Every time, for those 10 seconds or less, I'm free. Arguably one of the most repeated lines of this movie. Yeah. But it's also sad because if you're only free for less than 10 seconds at a time, I feel like you need to find a new hobby that makes you free for longer than 10 seconds at a time. He also claims that he's never driven that car before. Because it scares the shit out of him. scares the shit out of him. But it's arguably the only car in this entire movie that's probably capable of a 10-second quarter mile. True. Yeah. So yeah. he might want to get started. Maybe. Yeah. And All right, so here's another thing. So this... All right, so the original fa the fast and the fast and the furious, right? So there's multiple movies in the franchise obviously. You got The Fast and the Furious, you've got Too Fast Too Furious, you've got Tokyo Drift, you've got Fast and Furious cuz they just dropped the the. You've got like Fast 5, then they just got boring and just went 6, 7, 8, 9, whatever. Mm -hmm. But this is the only one. Well, this one Never mind. I take that back. This one, Too Fast Too Furious and Tokyo Drift. Those are the only ones that were centered around tuner cars. Um, and this one kind of eludes, and you get to see where it's going to go later on in the series, because Dom's got this uh, Mopar, this uh, Challenger, char what is this? Is it Challenger? Challenger. All right, so he's got this Challenger in the garage, and then, like, very shortly after this movie, Dodge steps in and clearly becomes a huge sponsor. And so now, like, th that's my, my biggest gripe with this franchise, is towards, once you get past um, uh, Tokyo Drift, mm -hmm. Like, it's just all you see are Dodges, Chargers, Challengers, like, trucks, like, Rams. All you see are Dodges, and it gets away from the tuner roots that this whole franchise started with. Oh, yeah. And that's what drew me in. That's why, like, the newer ones I don't care about as much. Haven't even watched the latest one, um, because after the first three, it just trails off so much that it's just, it kind of loses it for me. 
but I wish they would just come out with one and get back into the tuner realm. I wish like somebody, Toyota or Nissan or somebody would step up and throw some money at it and sponsor it so they can get back to the tuners. God, that sound. Before I put my blow off valve on, I loved it. I used to drag it back to high school. Oh, that's a sick shot though. Yeah. <laughs> He's just up there. He's just up there. At least the sound is accurate. Oh, well, there goes the button. All right, so that scene is obviously extremely iconic to this movie. Yeah. Uh, to, you know, it's, just, it's a sick, sick scene. I like it. However, <laughs> comma, what the fuck and why? So let's start at the beginning. Start at the beginning. So first off, your friend just died. <laughs> he just got shot in front of your house. Yeah. And he's laying at your house dead right now with your sister. I'm going to race you. <laughs> I'm going to try to beat you down this <laughs> fucking stretch of highway. Why are you thinking about it so much? <laughs> I've never thought about it like this. It's like what? Our friend dies. We kill some people and then we go karting. Like, what the <laughs> fuck? Like, I, this makes no sense. It wouldn't, it doesn't make any sense for it to be in this section of the movie. But it has to happen. It does have to happen. I'm, I'm looking at it, so when I see it, all I think about is when they launch, when the light turns green. Yeah. Tur Dom not only does a burnout, but also does a wheel stand at the same time, which are mutually exclusive events, because you need traction to do a wheel stand, and you need the absence of traction to do a burnout. Yes. But he does them both. Right. Which I guess we've already suspended reality anyways. So yeah, exactly. Matter. Yeah. The fact that he's doing it at all. And then he just sits there. <laughs> just cruising. <laughs> I, 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 oh. <laughs> I love it though, man. It's such an it's iconic such scene. It's such an awesome this. scene. The train at the end. And all that fun stuff. They just fucking yeeted across the railroad tracks. <laughs> the, I love how this, when the super comes down, you see the body kit compress, which goes to show you. It's a high-quality Veilside kit. It's not fiberglass because it would have exploded. It's clearly some sort of polyurethane or something. Yeah. So it's a good quality kit. Um, and then Dom, you know, gets a... I think he got a little happy he didn't get hit by the train. He's like, yeah, look, I made it. And then next thing you know, just... And then you're cartwheeling. So however ridiculous this race scene is, in the first place, it's an awesome racing scene. And I used to rewatch it over mm -hmm. and over and over again. Um, but that's pretty much it. That's yeah. that's pretty much all we got for this movie. It's an iconic movie. I love this movie very much. It had a lot to do with the. I mean, this sounds really stupid to say, but it has a fuck ton to do with who I am now. Yeah, uh, I'm yeah. a car enthusiast to my core. I'm always going to be, and it's a lot of it has to do with this movie. Yeah, me too, man. I'm I'm just glad that we got the opportunity to finally do this. It doesn't really fit with what we do in the channel, but you guys asked for it, or you know, we requested it. You guys said gave us a go ahead, so let's do it. We'll catch you guys on the next video. <laughs> Well, it looks like it's just us, buddy. How was your flight? Yeah? Cool. Well, I'm uh, going to go home tomorrow. You're going to be here with Abel all by yourself. You and Mr. Abel, you got to watch out for yourself. Huh? No, no, it's fine. I'll see you in a couple weeks. Okay. Okay, buddy, it's okay. <laughs>